I want to ask you about a couple of issues here at home. It's been three weeks now since the toxic train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, as you know. The mayor says he saw you in Ukraine, and he says it tells you he doesn't care about us. They're asking, is the president coming to Ohio? Do you have any plan to travel to Ohio, and have you talked with the mayor yet? Let's put this in perspective. Within two hours of that derailment, the EPA was in there. Within two hours. Every major agency in the United States government that had anything to do with rail and or cleanup was there and is there. In addition to that, I've spoken at length to the congresspersons, the governors, the senators from both states of Pennsylvania and, and in uh, Ohio. And I've made it clear to them anything they need is available. We'll make it available to them. Okay, so the movie goes like this. The biggest drug cartels in the world get together and buy up all the media and all the politicians and force all the people in the world to stay locked in their homes. And people can only come out if they take the cartel's drugs and keep taking them over and over. I threw the script away. I mean, who is going to believe that crazy idea? <laughs> I think that um, it's a little bit controversial, the mandate, because some people, they feel uh, they're reactive and stronger to the mandate. But also, on the other hand, it works. Uh, and uh, many countries now are seen so big. Uh, I was, for example, speaking with uh, uh, the Greek prime minister the other day, and he told me that they put a, a mandate. Actually, they put Mandate, if you don't get vaccinated and you're above 60 years old, 100 euros per month penalty. It's a fine. It's a like, fine. That's how like it Delta works. Airlines. And he told me, I can't take it anymore. Our hospitals are full of uh, the intensive care units. We have to postpone uh, electric surgery. So we need to, to push it. Now, as I said, this country has different culture. It's more free spirits. <laughs> Not that the Greeks are not, but uh, <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but they have the same okay, problem. Well, let's, let's ask the room. So, vaccine mandates, yay or nay? Who's for them here? Okay, nays. We got a couple. Maybe we'll hear from you guys in the questions. But in any event, it's pretty clear consensus here. On yeah, this, it so. is because they work. I've seen it. Even at Pfizer, we were we had to make. Um, a, a mandate for to ask your people, and uh, although we were at 90 percent, but this 90 was not moving, and it moved to 97 percent. Up to what? 97. Mm -hmm. Vaccinated, so it's a very big deal. Ultimately, the people closest to Putin, those who have to deal with him, those who he's keeping at the end of 40-foot tables while he <laughs> issues bizarre orders, they're the ones who need to act. They need to act for the good of Russia. They need to stop him. Whether or not this has turned into some kind of physical or mental uh, problems that uh, he either had or has in some way uh, come down with, we don't know. But his behavior is dangerous, and it's dangerous to the future of Russia. So my hope is that the people who are watching him, those who get close enough to see in person his behavior, which is so erratic, that they can try to prevent him from doing things that will not only be tragic uh, for Ukraine, but tragic for Russia, too. This should be stopped for Russia's sake. Treating them with the medicine they need, the absolute uh, targeted medicine that uh, will affect their, uh, their disease, and in doing this, we will, of course, improve the health of people, but we will also, I believe, reduce the cost uh, of healthcare because if you diagnose a cancer patient early, you can treat them with surgery or medical treatment, cure them, as opposed to waiting for them to become metastatic and, of course, being uh, in, in bad health, but also costing a lot of money. And finally, we can also save a lot of carbon because people don't know, but the uh, healthcare uh, services actually uh, produce 4% of uh, carbon emissions in the world. That's on average in the world, but in advanced uh, countries like the US, and I'm sure it's the same in Canada, 8% of carbon emissions come from the healthcare sector. 
and it's mostly in hospitals. So going to a hospital is bad for you, bad for your health, but you cost money, and also you generate a lot of carbon. So if we can keep people out of the hospital and cure them quickly, we will really ha affect uh, uh, people, but also uh, countries and societies uh, in a big way. And that's what we're trying to do. We, we work on this biology dimension. We work on a whole variety of technologies, antibody drug conjugates, immunotherapies for cancer. We also work on cell therapies, gene therapies these days, um, ctDNA, as I said. We're working on diagnostic technologies. We have a lot, large, large team of people around the world working on new diagnostic techniques. And I had a nurse named Pearl Nelson, military. She'd come in and do things that I don't think you learn in medical school, nursing school. She'd whisper in my ear. I didn't, couldn't understand them. She'd whisper, she'd lean down. She'd actually breathe on me to make sure that I was a, there was a connection, a human connection. She even went home and brought back her pillow from her own bed because she didn't knew the one I had the one comfortable. But I'm not joking. Now, San Francisco's COVID-19 emergency declaration is also slated to end tomorrow. Lots of people do say that's good news and that it's a sign of progress, but some other people worry about the city's most vulnerable. NBC Barry's Sergio Quintana takes a look. Wearing N95 masks and holding signs that read, no body is disposable and keep masks in health care, this small group of residents wants a simple answer from the mayor as San Francisco's pandemic public health order ends tomorrow. We're here to ask the question, what's the plan as the public health emergency ends? Kristen Urquiza is with a group called Marked by COVID. She lost a parent during the pandemic, and since then, she's been advocating for some of the most at-risk residents. She's with a coalition of groups who says lifting every COVID emergency declaration will be a major problem for some residents. We need to just make sure we are communicating, as we did at the beginning of the pandemic, what the plan is to ensure that there's no more displacement, no more evictions, and that people can access essential public services. Among the key protections the group is asking San Francisco to keep in place is eviction protections for those who may be past due on their rent because of COVID-related issues. They're also asking that San Francisco maintain its call-in remote access program for public comments during board and committee meetings. They also want the city to impose universal masking requirements at all medical facilities, including places like Walgreens or CVS. Alyssa Metra says everyone should feel safe while they're at a hospital and standing in line to get their prescriptions. What about someone who's just going in and getting a bag of chips? Should they be masked? Well, I think because it's also a quasi healthcare setting, yes. The group just delivered their letter to Mayor London Breed's office. Staff said she is not here, but they, of course, will pass along the letter to her. And now they're heading off to talk to some of the supervisors to try to garner support for their efforts. They did briefly talk with Supervisor Raphael Mandelman about their concerns. He did not have a comment for us, saying he hasn't studied their recommendations yet. The full board is currently considering Supervisor Mandelman's measure to discontinue remote access to public comments. They'll vote on that measure during tomorrow's full session. In San Francisco, Sergio Quintana, NBC, Bay Area News. Consumer Association Feder Consumatori has rung the alarm bell over the growing financial difficulties Italian families are faced with. Feder Consumatori National Observatory has found that one out of four families in Italy is struggling to cope with high inflation and rising cost of living. This, as the Bureau of Statistics is that has estimated a timid comeback in consumer confidence in February. According to Feder Consumatori, an increasing number of Italians are giving up on food quality to save money. 
Today, as the cost of living crisis has eroded families' purchasing power, we have recorded a 17% drop in the purchase of meat and fish and a 13% drop in the consumption of fruit and vegetables. We had asked the government to introduce significant supporting measures for the Italian families, but unfortunately our calls went utterly unheard. Prices in Italy rose more than 8% year-on-year in 2022, jumping to its highest 12-month gain in nearly 40 years when the lira currency was in use. According to Istat, Italy's annual inflation rate registered a slowdown in January, dropping to 10% from 11.6% in December. However, the situation has turned dire for many in the country. The cost of living went up big way, too much for a young student like me. Prices have doubled over the past months. The cost of staple food items, basic ingredients has gone crazy and also the cost of energy. To me, it's a theft by the government. According to analysts, high energy prices have been the main drivers for the bulk of those increases, pushed higher by the energy supply challenges that followed the Ukraine-Russia war. The poverty rate increased significantly in Italy in 2020-2022 period. In 2021, some 2 million families lived in absolute poverty, a figure accounting for over 5.5 million people that is destined to grow. Max Civilli, Press TV, Rome. All right, Master Plan Part 3. So, as uh, Zach was mentioning, the, the thing that I think is we wanted to convey probably more, more importantly than anything else that we talk about here is that there is a clear path to a sustainable energy earth. It's not, um, it doesn't require destroying uh, natural habitats. Uh, it doesn't uh, require us to be austere and stop using electricity and sort of be in the cold or anything. Um, the, the, the story, and I think it, this holds together quite well, and we'll be actually publishing a detailed white paper with all of our assumptions and calculations, is that there is a, there is a clear path to a fully sustainable Earth uh, with abundance. In fact, you could support a civilization much bigger than Earth, than, than much more than the, the 8 billion humans, uh, could actually be uh, supported sustainably on Earth. And I'm, I'm just often shocked and surprised by how few people realize this. Um, most of the smart people I know actually don't see a, a, this clear path. They, they think that um, there's, there's not a path to a sustainable energy future, or at least there's not one that uh, is sustainable at our current population, um, or that we'd have to resort to extreme measures. None of this is true. So we're going to walk through the, the calculations for how to create a sustainable energy civilization. Intermolk is a dairy alternative that we make from black soldier fly lava. We take the insects and we process it into a dairy alternative. It forms a rich and creamy liquid which looks and acts just like dairy. Intermolk is very rich in protein, fat, calcium, iron and zinc which is really good for you. And it's got a very creamy mouthfeel. The world needs alternatives to survive. Insects are vital for the future of food because they require very little land. They don't damage the environment like livestock. They don't produce greenhouse gases. And they meet the demand for ice cream. The world is going to struggle to produce enough food for the growing population and I find insects a very viable option. Can you believe it's made from insects? Hi, I'm Leah Besser. I live in Cape Town, and I make dairy alternatives from insects. Today, I want to take the opportunity to talk about an important piece of legislation that may or may not yet be on your radar. Last week, I introduced the uh, Central Bank Digital Currency Anti-Surveillance State Act to halt the efforts of unelected bureaucrats here in Washington, D.C. from stripping Americans of their right to financial privacy. 
Digital assets in the digital economy are the future, but the Federal Reserve should play no role in developing a central bank digital currency, or otherwise known as a CBDC. The consequences, if we get it wrong, are far too serious. The Biden administration is currently itching to create a digital authoritarian-styled surveillance-style digital dollar, uh, and through an executive order they are pursuing analysis on a retail CBDC that would not be open, permissionless, permissionless uh, or private. In fact, it would be ridden with significant risk to Americans' privacy, security, financial inclusion, and a whole lot more. This kind of digital currency would give the federal government access to and control over literally every financial transaction conducted by Americans. That's why I, along with a number of my colleagues, introduced the CBDC Anti-Surveillance State Act. It's going to prohibit the Fed from issuing a CBDC directly to anyone. Uh, it's going to bar the Fed from using the CBDC to implement monetary policy and control our economy. And it's going to require the Fed's CBDC projects to be transparent if they get to go forward, to be transparent to Congress and the American people. We need these common sense guardrails to prevent unelected bureaucrats here in Washington from sacrificing Americans' right to financial privacy. As I think Mike Gallagher's committee is going to show us tonight, uh, we do not want to emulate the CCP. We should not be taking our, uh, our uh, direction from the Communist Party of China. Developing a digital version of the U.S. dollar that makes transactions more efficient, extends financial inclusion, and does not compromise American sovereignty or privacy will send us into the next several generations of the digital economy, and we can't afford to get this wrong. Today we've conducted a successful demonstration with the University of Technology in Sydney. This has been a four-way collaboration supported through the Defence Innovation Hub and using our partnership with the Defence Science and Technology Group, DSTG. This four-way collaboration focused on how we could create a brain robotic interface that will allow a soldier, rather than operating an autonomous system with a command console, to operate the system using brain signals. What was created was a headset that a soldier could use using the HoloLens 2 model that had an AI decoder via a Raspberry Pi that would translate brain signals into explainable instructions. What's so exciting about this technology is it has the opportunity to be used with a number of different autonomous systems. We conducted two short demonstrations today. The first demonstration showed a soldier operator commanding an autonomous system, being the Vision 60 ghost robot, to a series of waypoints along the ground and this was conducted successfully. The potential of the project is, is actually very broad. At its core, it's translating brain waves into zeros and ones, and that can be implemented into a, a number of different systems. It just happens that uh, in this particular instance, we're translating into control for a robot. The second demonstration was having a soldier operator acting in the role of a section commander and providing directions to both the ghost robots and other members of their fire team. And they conducted a simulated patrol clearance of a number of buildings here at the Madura Range Urban Operations Centre. This technology enables me to not only control the ghost robot as well as monitor its video feed, but it allows me to be situationally aware of my surroundings as well as my team to be able to control all movements of that battlefield clearance. This is very much an idea about what might be possible in the future. We're really excited to see where the technology might go and to work with our stakeholders to develop a wide range of use cases in order to better determine how we can support the military practitioner and the warfighter. I've watched a lot of the, I think some similar shows that you've watched and listened to podcasts, and I've tried to kind of skirt the periphery and not quite dip my toes in that. I've been so focused on the science and the 
the lipid nanoparticle and all the damage that that's doing. But when I start to look at videos of, of like Trudeau saying, oh, that felt great in my arm. I feel a tingle <laughs> and blatant lies. I think there's been blatant lies throughout this whole the last two, three years. Uh, I know the United States isn't as uh, locked down as other areas, and we don't have the same things happening. Like when we see the videos coming out of Australia and the camps that they had set up, that that scared the crap out of me. And then the social idea. So when you talk about that, there's a patent that I found that is tied to the social credit system, and it's an app. And it was a combination of, and it was just developed within a couple of years that would also show your medical status tied into your social ID. And if you got so many jabs that were going to be tied into it, I just want to say, you know, for people watching and listening, uh, I was against listening or reading any of this stuff. Uh, I'm a, a lefty politically, now politically homeless. <laughs> so, and uh, I, I am starting to shift over. I don't want to say to, to this side of the fence, but I'm starting to question things. So I've been just help, holding firm in the science saying I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to be a part of that. I, I don't know what's going on there. But now in combination of like the rack being dissolved, the you know, just the sequence of events that have occurred the use of the the credit system and the social ID, yeah, I worry that that's going to be tied into not just the current jabs, but other medical stuff too, that like, that's not where it's going to end, which is why I would never get genetic testing on myself just in FYI. I, I can't advise anyone to not do that, but the movie Minority Report really comes to mind as well. And I, having your, having your genetics on file with a company means you just gave away your, your, you just gave that away. If you need a single location to get cutting edge information and keep up with the rapidly changing world around us, tune into Grand Theft World, where a forensic historian and a logic professor break down the week's news in depth and in context. There's a ton more there, so go check it out. And don't forget to get your Freedom Vault on the homepage.